answered, just go ahead and type that question in. I know a lot of you may not have begun this process yet, so um, it may be slow going for the first couple of these. I know last week we didn't have tons of questions, um, but, but we'll see how many we have this week. And, and this is Wendy. If you do have a question and you have a mic or you're on the phone and you can talk, if you would rather us unmute you, we can do that. Just um, type in to the question panel that you would like to be unmuted, and we can take care of that for you. Okay, okay. first question. For students that take two semesters of band or orchestra and receive two credits, what is the best way to set this up for online requesting? Hmm. <laughs> That's a different well, one way is you could have separate course codes. Remember, you have a local extension that you can put on those courses, so if the student requests one semester of band, it's got to be denoted that he get he go ahead and request the second semester of band. That's one way for online record uh, request. Another way is to um, when you set up your course request screens, you set up a group that only contains those courses that they will take both semesters, and then when you set up that section of the request screen, you tell it to generate two requests. So that if they request band, it'll re it'll enter two course requests on their course request screen. But you have to remember to check on the course that they can take, they can repeat that course in a different term. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's one of the key things right there is to repeat that course in different terms. You've got to make sure if you're using that same course number and generating two requests that you do say repeat the course in different terms. All right. Once students have completed making course requests in Power Scheduler, is there a way to lock the screen so that once we close registration, they cannot change their request? If, if you are using online requests, there's a little checkbox at the top that says um, this grade level is eligible to create requests, you uncheck that little box. Once that little box is unchecked, there's no access to um, that screen on the parent portal or the student portal side. But they can't be locked student by student. The only way to really right. lock student by student, and it's not the best answer, but once the student, if you are working with them and you don't want to uncheck the grade level, you can uncheck schedule the student, knowing that your reports will not include that student, then when finished, you would have to go back and check the student's schedule. Right. So what Doris is saying, if your counselors are working with the students individually, once they've created their online requests or they've checked them, they can go into that student's preferences and uncheck schedule this student. Keeping in mind, as she said, that they're, your numbers won't include it in tally or anything, and you've got to remember to go back and possibly run that auto fill again and say, yes, schedule this, this student to all grade levels. But that would stop the screen. Yes. Are there online training men? Are there training manuals online to help facilitate building the schedule? Absolutely. If you go to PowerSource, there's lots of information that is available for um, Power Scheduler, and there are some distance learning modules that will walk you all the way through the process. And those are very, very good. I would recommend that you watch those distance learning modules. You can search in the distance learning for Power Scheduler, and it'll bring up all of them. I think there are five. And so 
those are really good. We also sent out a list of materials um, for people to download so that you can um, download those materials and have them available as well. But there's a prepare to build workbook, a prepare to load or a load process workbook that's out there on PowerSource, and those are what we're using in our prepare to schedule um, sessions that we're doing now. Exactly right. Uh, the next question, how can we embed a link to our online screen setup to direct parents or students to our 1516 course selection guide? When you make a course selection screen, the instructions that you post are all HTML responsive, so you can use the simple HTML code to embed your link into the text. And if you're unsure how to embed a link in HTML, you can Google that. It's a pretty simple process. Um, the next one would be, will teacher recommendations show on the student screen? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't I'm not sure either. I don't I don't think that they do, but I wouldn't swear to that. I, I really don't know. That's something we'll have to investigate and see if we can find out for you. Oh, Caitlin says they do show up. Who does? Caitlin. Okay. Says they do show up. Okay. That, nice to know. Thank you, Caitlin. One thing you want to keep in mind is um, semester one's probably already passed, so you may have a hard time getting, the teachers may have a hard time getting back to those semester one classes to put recommendations from semester one in. So it's something you want to do every year ahead of time, get, keep your teachers up to date on that. And then right. There's a field that we're using, I think about page 61, there are directions on how to do that. Okay. There's yes. Yeah, and and you can, it, it yeah, you can also do them from the administrative side if the teachers hand write the recommendation and give it to um, someone with admin access. Those recommendations can be put in from the admin side by pulling up the student, and there's directions on how to do that as well. Okay. When you place your request for scheduling, is there a way to make a designation for your alternates? There's definitely a way to make a designation for your alternates, and you need to really do that. When you're doing your course setup, your request screen setup, you check whether that group is an alternate group or not. If counselors are just entering course requests by hand, they need to, they need to check the box to say it is an alternate, and also put the E in there so that the system will know that the alternate can only replace an elective course. If the box is not checked and the E code is not there for the alternate and the elective, it will replace a core course. If a counselor wants to individually schedule some students, is it best through Power Scheduler, or can it be done if they change the year to 1516 on the main screen and use the modify schedule request for next year? Either works. Yeah. Either one works. It's totally up to you which which way you have them do it because either way works. Yeah. The thing you just need to keep in mind is make sure they go back to to 14. 15 before they start doing some other things, if you do it on the live side. That's all the questions on the board at the present time. I'm looking for the, the prerequisite information. So 
So another question, when can you start scheduling students in Power Scheduler? As soon as you have all of your um, pre-scheduling information set up and your screens or however you're going to enter information in, you can begin to enter information into Power Scheduler now if you're ready to. That's not an issue at all. On page 48 of the load document, there was a checkbox to turn on PowerSchool admin portal. Are we supposed to see this in our instance? That's no, no that, that, that print screen is in, a new, in another release. The release we're going still has the one checkbox only. Yes, we did happen to catch that la uh, week before last that that print screen was wrong from Pearson. It'll be cool when we get those checkbox, won't it? <laughs> but unfortunately, that is not the one we're going to. Course recommendations are on page 40 of the Prepare to Build workbook, How to Enter Course Recommendations. Right. Oh, no more questions. Gosh, we're good. Hey, what can we say? <laughs> we're on a roll. <coughs> we'll have to move to the talent portion. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Keep in mind that as you begin this process, those three things that have to be set up at the LEA level before you can begin to work in Power Scheduler at the school level. Um, Please check the courses to make sure you've got the course numbers right. Check your departments and make sure your courses have departments on them at your LEA level. They should at this point have departments on them from DPI. I know last week I ran into a couple, but I've also sent that up, so we'll see about those getting on. Can we get a list of the correct departments? Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, we had it last year because we imported it for a lot of schools. Because it was late coming out. It came from the Enterprise Controller, so they should already be in your system. On a load, when we copy the master schedule, is it necessary to check and validate or check the start periods since everything was copied from the prior year? Private year, prior year. I can do this. <laughs> Don't have me say these. It's, it's, it's Monday, Monday, Aaron. It's Monday. It's okay. Bless my heart. <laughs> the document doesn't address this. So when you copy, you already have all of your sections. They're already assigned into periods, so the course parameter valid start period doesn't have to be addressed unless you are building. I can't ask the question, but I can answer it. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, Julie says it looks like she has two sets of departments. Yeah, I had one other school say that, and I am going to check on that. That's one of the things I've got a meeting set up with someone about to see if what needs to be done to take care of that. They probably import it because when you import it, it doesn't override it, just adds to. Okay, I'm going to show my screen, and this is a list of the departments at this time. These are DPI departments. You want to make sure that when you are adding departments to rooms, to teachers, and to courses, if they don't have them when you're in Power Scheduler, that you create your departments exactly like this list here. If you do not, it will throw an error when you start to validate and say it's not a valid department. The next question is, is it recommended for Power Scheduler to build your schedule or for you to hand build it? That's really up to you and your individual situation. If you feel as though building a schedule would save you work or help you in some way, it's there for you to use. If you feel like you have a functional master timetable that's easier to copy and tweak, that would be the way to go. But you have to evaluate your schedule for yourself. The one thing I will add to that is if you're building a true student-driven schedule from request, it probably would be best to let the system build your schedule for you. Like Aaron said, it's totally up to you, but if you actually put the master schedule in, it's not a true student-driven schedule. So it depends on what your school's trying to do. Okay. We're good from the board. These departments that you see on my screen should be already at your school level. If you log into school, and let me show you where that's done, you log into school setup under setup school, scrolling down under scheduling and click on departments. If you find that you have something different here, or you have more than one set of departments here, go ahead and log a ticket to the service desk and let them go ahead and start the process of working on that for you. Um, we don't want you to go in there and delete one out because they have IDs attached to them, and that one may be the ID that's attached to a course or a teacher. So we need to let the service desk look at that and see what they need to do. You want, you got anything you want to remind them, Doris? So far not. <laughs> just thinking. Okay. Well, we probably want to remind this bunch about the, up, the, up, the upgrading their engine because okay. that group last week we're told. Just in case we got a different audience, we need to remind them of the upgrade. So this weekend is maintenance weekend, and you all know that we're going to 8.1. Yay! Which is what you've been seeing in the training database that we've had. What we'd like to remind you is that once we've upgraded, you want to go ahead and download that engine again, the Power Scheduler engine, because there have been some upgrades to that engine. If you've started the process, it's not going to hurt, but go ahead and upgrade the engine in Firefox. And you can do that. Once you're in, you're going to go into Power Scheduler. You're going to scroll to the bottom under Tools. And right here's your engine download, and that's what you're going to download is that engine after next weekend, after this weekend. Oh, yeah. Wow. We're in February already. <laughs> Grandma day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quiet bunch. <laughs> Come on, 
Welcome, guys. Ask questions. Yeah. We're here for you. I have a feeling that Mark's going to be busy. Someone asked about the screens. Here's where I want to show you. Remember someone just asked about turning the screen off to, to parents and students? You would do that through requesting up at the top screen setup. On a grade level, there's this little checkbox right here that says this grade may register for classes. That must be checked on or have a check mark in it in order for parents and students to use the screen. Once you've completed the process with all your parents and students, you want to uncheck that box so that they can no longer go back in and make changes. And while we're on the screen, Erin, is this where you were talking about putting that HTML comment to a hair connect to your course list? Yep, right there, that message that Sue Ann just selected is all HTML response right responsive. So you can use HTML to modify your text, change the color, the size. You can also, and I posted in the question, the, um, the HTML tag to embed a link. So I recommend you do that, and then if you have your course guide available on your district website, it'll link students right over there, and they can tab back and forth between the two. It works really slick. So a question from the board, what is a realistic timetable for the students entering their course requests and getting a master schedule? Oh my goodness, it depends on your school. I mean, I've seen schools get all the requests in in a week by opening the lab up for a grade level per day. And by that Friday, they're done and ready to build a schedule. But then, do you know your resources? Do you know your money, your allocation? Is that the right word I'm using here? Um, there's a lot to go into it. Just, it can take you several months to get everything in, set up, and ran. Sue Ann, what do you find? What, what I, what I want to warn you about is do not wait till the last minute to start the process and begin. You want to allow yourself enough time at the end of the year, at least a week probably ahead of time, to do your commit. That way, if there is an issue with the commit, then you can email the service desk and they can help you through that process before e end of year um, happens. So what I would start with is, when am I going to do my commit? And then I would start backdating everything from there. So let's say it's going to take you three weeks, you think, to build a master schedule. So backdate your data from there. How long from there do you think it's going to take to get the kids' request in? That's kind of what I would go on. We've started the process now. You've started getting everything set up. Keep in mind, end of year, and at least a commit a week ahead of time. And then fill your information in from there. If a school wishes to go from a one-day schedule to a two-day schedule, is the option to load and tweak still available, or must you build? I'm sure. A lot of tweaking. A lot of tweaking, but you can use an update selection, go right in there. It'd be fairly simple. Of course, my idea is simple. It's not everyone's idea is simple. Yeah. I will say that right up front, <laughs> but it can be done. It can be. It's just going to be a, a good bit of tweaking if you're going to do that because you've got to make sure you have your uh, periods per meeting set up, your frequency set up, your appropriate valid day set up. If you're switching terms, make sure the valid term is set correctly for the course that you're offering. If you're building. If, if you're building. If you're building. If, if you're loading and you've gone from a two-day to a one-day, you still got to update all that stuff. Or from a one day to a two day. One day to two day. You're yeah. going to go up to update selections. Yeah. Go up to yeah. update selections. Yeah. So if it happens. Yeah. As I've told the two classes I have been with, scheduling is not a DPI says to do this and this and this. It is different at every school within an LEA. So it takes a team to figure out what you're going to do. And it's not just the data manager coordinator. It takes the principal. It takes the counselors. It takes whoever else is on that scheduling team to figure out what you're doing at that individual school. Wendy, you got anything you need to fill in?
Okay, the three things that you need to have done at the LEA level are the years and terms. And again, keep in mind that for scheduling purposes, the LEA only has to have the year-long strike. But it must be the first day the students are in their seat from the earliest school that you have beginning. So if you have a year-round school or an early college, your first day of school needs to be the day the students set their seats in the seat for that school. Last day needs to be the last day your latest school is in session. The last day the students have their seats in a seat. No padding in your calendars whatsoever for years and terms. And let me talk about availability, guys. When you're at the LEA and you're setting your courses for availability, Please, don't do them all and dump them at all schools. Take your time. Go into your high school. Take your high schools first. Go into your courses at the LEA level. Then work with just your high school courses for 1560 and give them to your high schools. Don't give them middle school courses because I promise you someone will schedule a middle school course in a high school. Then go to your middle schools and just work with your middle school courses, making them available there, following through with your elementary. Sue Ann's got them pulled up now. But uh, this, this is where she was talking about when you can select just the particular school. Through your filter on courses, that's where you want to do that. You really don't want to make all courses. I know last year we were making a mad dash. We were all on such a huge learning curve. And some of that just got really messy, as y'all probably know, and I'm being kind. But right now, what we'd like for you to really take the time when we can, and we're letting you know now, find those courses and make them available, but work with the high school, then middle school, then elementary. Do y'all, you two have anything else to say about those? What we were saying about how to make those available? No, I think that's... That's the key right there because then you don't end up with mess that, that your schools have to go through and uncheck the courses to be taught. What I will say is that if you make courses available that have been ended by DPI or ended by you or there's an issue with the course, you will have by your course catalog a red triangle with an exclamation mark in it. You need to take action on those courses that turn up in red when you do edit catalog. Those courses will not commit back to the live side. So if you think that you can go ahead and schedule sections in them and everything, that's fine and dandy on the power scheduler side. It will let you. But when you hit commit, those sections and those requests and everything will not commit back to the live side. So if you've got a red triangle, you need to try and figure out what is wrong with that course or those courses. Uh, maybe an end date and you're going to have to uncheck it and make it unavailable to, at the school level or at the catalog level, but take care of those red triangles. The good news is when you hit commit, it gives you a list of your bad course numbers. And if you don't want them fixed from there, just go ahead and do a print screen so you know the sections you've got to read the courses you have to reschedule. But if, is it a court, if it is a course ended by the state, you're not going to be allowed to use it. It will cause you a problem on your SAR. Yeah, you'll have to get a new course number. It won't copy over. It just gives you a list of the bad ones. That's good. Well, we've talked about availability. What we think is, because we've been getting some questions in about how to work with that. In fact, I think a document will be created. So a document being created? It has to be edited, yes. Okay. One thing I do want to remind you, let me get back to the school level, a school level, and back into Power Scheduler. Requesting and course groups. When you begin to make your course groups, oh, yeah, yeah. 
What you want to make sure you do is you want to make sure you go to the center of the page, right under the second blue line, and click Current Catalog. And you also want to click on your particular school. Something else you might want to consider, and it's what I've instructed or recommended that my schools do, as you begin to make these course groups or my regions, um, let's say I would say 10th grade um, English. And then I would put my school number beside it. Because if you leave it on all schools, someone will be more than happy to delete that course group for you because everybody can see it then. This way, if you denote it somehow, um, depending on how your LEA wants you to do it with school number or initials or whatever, at least someone can give you a call and say, hey, you need to go back and fix this course group to make it just for your school. We've been given the same directions to win because somebody might want to play with your head and put a few more courses that you don't want in that selection. Yeah, we had one person last uh, week that said, well, she didn't use course groups, but somebody kept, they kept popping up. And any school or anyone at any school who has access to Power Scheduler can go in and start to begin to look around and play with these groups. So. Um, if they start popping up, you'll know why. That somebody's in there trying to learn some information. But again, you want to start in the middle of that page and click Current Course Catalog, because if you don't, and you do it afterwards, your name goes away, your, your applies to goes away, and you end up not using the current course catalog. If you come up to some information and it says um, something like no current course catalog, what you need to do is go back to your scenario and reassociate the catalog to that scenario. We've had that happen. I'm ready for some questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, Patricia says, FYI, in adding a new course after course groups are set up, it seems that we have to go back to the course group and choose current catalog again to pick up the added course. This in turn detaches the course, detaches the group from the requirement on the course setup page. We've had to go back to the requirement and reattach the course group. Is there a better way for that to happen? I read it again. I have, I have not seen that happen. I've not seen it happen either. My guess is if you modify a group, there's the there's the off chance that it could do something to any screen that's using that group. Best practice would be if you change a group, go back to the screens that use that group and just make sure everything is still okay. Now, something I do want to mention here is I had one person log in and they had groups from last year showing up. But what you've got to keep in mind is those groups are connected to last year's course catalog ID. So you can't really assume that everything's going to be the same. So those groups show up, you need to make sure that you know they're connected to the current course catalog ID and have the correct year term ID. How can you schedule early graduates? Oh, oh there's several, there's several ways. ways. <laughs> <laughs> How do you want to do it? Course, or do we want to do student free? I think student free is a good I, way. I think that's a good. You don't. So in Power Scheduler, constraints. There is a thing here called student free under load constraints. So those early graduates schedule four courses, right? And that's all they have. So before you load, you get a list of those early graduates. You come to Constraints, Load Constraints, Student Free. Click on Student Free. Say New. Associate the student name with the, with the free constraint. You select Semester 2, and you check the period that the student will not be available for classes. So you would have semester, you have the student's name, semester two, and if you're a four-period day, you would have one, two, three, and four checked. 
That way the student would only schedule first semester. Now, Sue Ann, we did have some who chose to use the 9900 course number, and they, okay. get, they set that course up in preferences to be second semester, and, not, and to take place all of the periods that were available, and for every day. And they would assign that course request to the early graduates. So there's two ways that we know of you can use. And also, you can do that, as Wendy said before, on your screen, you could say generate four requests, and they only have to request it once. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So there's several ways you can do a new, a new early grad. Uh, it's just really what way you prefer. Okay. Okay, I've got a, I had a question here. Someone wanted me to show how to designate alternates, okay? So if you have a student, and let me get into a different database here. So Ann, you can go into um, the one you're going to be using this week. Yep, I am. <laughs> Sorry, I can't type this morning. Power Scheduler. Let's see if I happen to have any students in Power Scheduler or if I have to send them all over. Yay. Ah. Oh, look, Gwen's got a Gwen. Gwen's gifted. Gifted Gwen has a bunch. Okay. On request, I can say new and I can associate some courses. Oh, and I don't have courses. Mm. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I don't have a scenario. Look at your schedule. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't have it set up, and I don't want to set it up in here because that's the process I go through with them. I guess I'm going to have to. Okay, I'm going to set up a scenario so that I can make a course catalog. Notice I have no gaps here in my dates. process I just went through was setting up an, an auto scheduler scenario and then I copied my uh, master schedule from the current year to this coming year. Oh, that was pretty. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, I have courses now. So what I want to do is I want to pick a student.
And on their request screen, I want to associate some courses. And I'm just going to pick some. As you scroll down through here, you'll notice that there is no other information in the courses. In order for a course to be an alternate, it needs to have this box checked and a code of E beside it. Anything that is an elective needs to have just the code of E beside it. But your alternates need to have the checkbox and the E. Okay, I hope that answered the question. And even setting up course groups, you can designate electives and alternates when you set them up. Right. Let me go back to Power Scheduler. And it's important that you ensure that those course groups are marked appropriately. New. And if you scroll down, and when you create your course groups, Mm -hmm. When you set the screen, that it asks you to identify what it is. Yeah. We're going to have creative writing here as our English group. Okay, so I have one group. Now when I go back to my screen, and I begin to set up my screen, It will ask you, what type of request is it? Is it an alternate, an elective, or a required course? So if you say it's an alternate, it will automatically put that checkbox and that E in there. If you say it's an elective, it will automatically put the E for you. But if your counselors are setting up or sitting down with the students and doing these pages individually, like the one that I just did that said request, you need to have them go back and put that checkbox in E and put the E. We ran into a lot of problems last year that that information was not there, and so it was scheduling elective courses before it ever scheduled core courses. Whereas if they use the screen setup, it's already, already done. done. Already done for them. Not that I'm pushing it, however. <laughs> How are we in questions? All right. What we'd like to you, for you to keep in mind is we will be having some shortened versions of the BUILD workshops. They were four days last year, and they truly are workshops. There's no training that goes on during that time. It's just workshops. You need to have everything completed and at least a valid validation done before you come to those. You may end up with one error that you cannot figure out. Go ahead and send us a ticket to the service desk, and we'll see about getting those errors, help you walk through those before those build workshops. They will be limited to um, right now we're thinking one school per LEA. Or per, yeah, per, per, LA, per LEA? Per LEA. Per LEA, yeah. One school. So there's information on Power Source about build. So you want to be sure and watch those distance learnings. You want to be sure and, and um, look for that build workshop workbook. There are things out there about errors. They help you walk through those errors and make sure you get those taken care of. question from the board. Is there any way to prioritize in the schedule other than clicking alternates? Prioritize. I'm not sorry. Sure. Yeah, we're not sure what you're asking. Prioritize in the schedule. Maybe you can, can give us a little bit more information there.
Are you talking about prioritizing your alternates? Like alter, this is my first alternate, second alternate, third alternate. Is that what you're talking about? If you go ahead and unmute Caitlin, and then she can um, talk. Caitlin, you should be good to talk now. Okay, the question is, in the past, we've always been able to allow our kids to sign up for eight classes. They're the classes they need and their top elective choices, and we've been able to designate two alternates. So if they didn't get some of their top choices, these are the two classes I would like if I can't get my top eight. And last year, we weren't able to do that. You can do that within this system. If you're using screens, the, the registration screens, you give a, a minimum and a maximum. Alternates are not included in that. So you set up a separate group as an alternate group, and you instruct them to pick mm -hmm. two alternates. So um, we would maybe give a minimum eight, and then a minimum eight and a maximum of eight. And then you can still have another group called alternates. Alternates do not affect the minimum and maximum you put at the top. It's not included in those eight. Okay, and we, I guess we set that up at each individual school? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And each individual grade level at the school. Okay. So they can use the same course group of courses. Right. Does that mean? But you would have to set up one for you. Okay, thank you. And if the counselors are putting it in, they can go ahead and put in 10 and just check two as alternates and make sure they have that E in there. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. You're welcome. All right, we got a lull again. We got another hour and ten minutes, guys. Come on. Here's that red triangle that I was talking about. If you look on my screen by your course catalog, and when you go into your course catalog, oh, helps if I click on it. It's not an active catalog. And just a reminder that we are recording the session, and it will be posted on the NCSIS website shortly. You'll notice I went back into my scenario that I had created. My catalog said it was not active, but even though it's connected here, you still have to come into your scenario and click Submit in order to make it active. There's that red triangle. If you'll notice, all of my courses are in red. That's because I haven't copied them over and 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 you haven't set your scheduling year either. I know I haven't, but that still won't fix it. I did this the other night, and it um, oh, it fixed it for mine the other day. That's because I didn't copy the courses over. I just created the catalog. I didn't um, make them available for the LA level yet. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, there you go. Got oh, it did fix it. Yeah. Okay, the other day it didn't fix it. Now, see, we have about your full year showing up there, don't you? Yeah, need to get rid of that. Get rid of that. How am I going to get rid of that? That's a good question. Uh, maybe I'll go to years and terms and fix it. All right. Again, what I want to tell you is, I'll show you in just a second. If you will notice, um, when you copy your schedule from last year to this year, it usually changes those dates. So you have to go back and, and make all of that date correct. Once you've set all that up, you want to make sure that you go in here and you click on the year and term, and you set this import file term ID number. That needs to be set so that everything will import on your commit correctly. OK, 
Okay? Is it mandatory to have years and terms set up at the school level before the LEA can make a course available for the scheduling year? No. What will happen at the LEA level when you hit make available and you set it all up and you submit it, you get the readout of how many schools are affected. Well, the last one shows schools in conflict. If all the schools' years and terms have been set up, you will see nothing there. But if you have schools missing the year and term year strike, you will see that those schools are in conflict. But as soon as the school sets up the year strike, they'll know that their courses will now be there. So the courses go, they just can't see them until they set up the years and term. They're out in la la land waiting for the year and term to be set up. And they do come through. And this person is asking to confirm if you set a course group as alternate, it does not affect the maximum requested. Exactly. On your set screen set up here, you set, and I will tell you, put your information in here, your minimum and your maximum, and then submit. Then go back and start to create your groups. But if you say a minimum of eight and a maximum of eight, and then you set up an alternates group down here, it will not affect the minimum and maximum, as long as you have that group set as an alternate group. See right up here at the top where it says 8 and 8, number of credit hours each student must submit, excluding alternate requests. So as long as you have that group set as alternate, then you're fine. When should we set the default term 1516 at the LEA level? After EOI. Now you don't want to change that term, default term to 1516 any time during this school year, but you definitely want to change it after EOI if you're going to continue to enter course requests after EOI on the Y side, because if you don't, you cannot see the 1516 catalog. But the scheduling year and power scheduler should be changed as soon as you set up your scenario. Exactly. Remember, power scheduler is kind of like our old master timetable builder. I kind of call it a sandbox over there where you do everything for next year in the sandbox. Does not affect this year. What percentage are we wanting when power school shows conflicts? We don't know what a good number is. Mm, okay. What do you I, mean? I hope you don't have a lot of conflicts. And, and sometimes, you know, if you're a smaller school, you're going to have more conflicts than larger schools. It's just simply that you have to have more singletons based on right. your resources. Your resources. You're right. One thing we've, I've suggested to my people is that when you begin to set up your scenario for period, you only use the current periods that you're going to schedule. You may have a before school period and an after school period, but I would not include those right now. I would wait until after you've built your master schedule and everything is completed, then add those periods back right before you commit. 
what happens, yeah, or you can add them back after you commit. But what happens a lot of times is um, you see this information up here on a student's schedule, and it'll say 100% total request satisfied. But when it says percent schedule, it'll say something like 94%. That's because you have those two extra periods in there. Even though you do not tell it to schedule those periods, when it figures that schedule percent, it still takes them into consideration. So that's why we say do not include them at this point until your everything's scheduled. And if you use homeroom and you're not putting a homeroom request in, don't allow, don't add that period either. Wait till, like Sue Ann said, you finish with your scheduling. That way you're you feel more comfortable in your reports as well right. when you see those numbers. It's less work to right. for setting up those course preferences. Right. One advantage to not having them there is when you go to your courses and your course preferences, down here under valid start period, if it can start in any of those periods, then you can leave it blank. If you have those extra two periods, five and six here, you must come to every course and check the valid periods that it can start in. Can you clarify what you mean by singleton? Singleton means that that course has one section and only one section. You may have 25 requests and that's it. Single section of a course is a singleton. And your doubletons were the two. A lot of your AP classes will be singleton. Um, sometimes some of your uh, things like advanced woodworking or your level four um, ROTC or something like that will be singleton. To have one section and only one section. Not enough requests for more than one. When should you put closed classes in the schedule? Say again. When should you put closed classes in the schedule? I'm not sure what you mean by closed classes. And are you talking about closed at max or sections you don't want to be scheduled into anymore? Who is that from? Hey. Hey. Closed classes, meaning I was typing it. Sorry, I wasn't typing fast enough. Um, like it's a tryout, or there's an application, so it's not open to all students. It's only open to those students that made, say, the dance team or made the yearbook staff. Or even um, if you got into like EC or ESL population where we only have a specific, um, so like English one for this, the Spanish speaking students. How are you going to do your scores request? Are you doing so, it with parents or will you be doing it by the guidance counselors? The guy, our, how we do course requests, our guidance counselors meet with our students one-on-one -on -one and they fill out basically a form um, saying these are the classes I want and then these are my uh, alternates and then we take them into the lab at a later date because we thought that we actually couldn't start loading them until March because that's kind of what we were told. Um, and then that's where they load into it. But we've had trouble where kids say register for the dance team class, but they actually don't make the dance team. And then we have to retroactively pull them out of that class, and then that causes massive problems for us. Well, you're going to run into that situation no matter what if you let them register for the class. So that's kind of what I'm thinking for those 
you may not want to start until you know. When do you know who made those classes? They're kind of, I guess in the past, this is my first year at the school, at the past they have, um, they've uh, done it later, but we're asking the teachers to have that a little bit earlier. Um, but so we're, your suggestion is to wait until we know who makes those teams and then only allow those kids in. Well, it just depends on when you're going to do that. I mean, if you're not going to do that until the end of March, then n no, I don't think I'd make that suggestion. <laughs> Um, it's really tough because you're going to run into that. Most schools run into that anyway. Um, and you can pull the ones out who don't make it in math. You can math add a new request and math delete that one for them. Um, Those can always do the, the hand schedule. schedule. Yeah. yeah, there is that constraint, I believe. I'm so are we able to hand schedule then? Should so the kids that we need are some students that you can pre schedule into some classes. After you build them, if you know the section, you can use the that constraint. Um, I forgot what it's called. So let me ask this: How many sections of that particular kind of class do you usually have? One or more than one? Usually just one, but it kind of depends. If we're like if we're discussing like dance and yearbook or our ESL English one, then it's just it's a singleton. If you know when those are going to be taught, you could go ahead and pre-schedule those. Just pre-schedule those students. Yes. Yeah, pre-schedule those courses and those students. Because we're only talking a few, not the masses. Yes. And generally, our scheduler is the masses. Okay, so we, and when we schedule them, we would have to schedule their whole, all eight classes, right? No, yeah. just the one you care about. Just that no, one, okay. The ones that can go fall wherever their, their holes are, Okay. those let the system do. Okay, awesome. That's great. Thank you. anymore. There's some good questions being asked this week. This one was a concern about having students come through the scheduling process with lots of holes in their schedule or getting courses out of sequence, math two before math three, or math three before math two. Those are load um, constraints that you can put in and you need to, to do that. I would suggest that you be consistent about what you do. If you start and say math one before math two, math two before math three, math three before math four, don't pick another class and say math four after math three, math three after math two. Be consistent about the way that you do that process. Okay? Those are done. on the constraints tab. Nope, sorry. Lied. I lied to you. Sorry. On courses, it's done through the relationships tab. Okay? You would say new. Anatomy and physiology. Must load the term before. What must it load the term before? Let's just say keyboarding. So this would say anatomy and physiology must load the term before keyboarding. So it's going to be, that's where you're going to set that up. And there are several courses that you probably want to set that up for. Um, English, maybe, math, sequence. Any course that has a sequence, it would be good to set that up for. And on those constraints, you have, um, there are several. 
several relationships that you can make. Um, there's a co-rec, a, a post-rec, a pre-rec, not a co-rec, distinct terms, or must load the term before or the term after. So any way you want to do those, you can. And those are load relationships that need to be done before you load the students in. Once you submit this, this is what it looks like. And I will tell you, Doris and Wendy and I, all three, get confused with this. So <laughs> what it says, it says, anatomy and physiology must load the term before keyboarding. And any student that has selected both those courses will load in that order. If they've only got one of those courses, like anatomy and physiology, then it's not going to affect them in any way. It will put that where it best can fit it. But please, please use relationships sparingly, because when you start building, you may, if you have tons of them, you may have to take some out because they may be too restrictive. And those are build relationships. Yes. This one is a load relationship that we just did. Doesn't take it into account until it begins to load the students into the system. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, we have one more, um, another question. Does the scheduler recognize prior year courses for prereqs? No, it does not. Because prereqs are an LEA level course information piece, and because of the wide use of different course numbers by the Department of Public Instruction, it is not recommended, we do not recommend that you do prereqs. You would have to figure out what the, for seniors, the last four years of options for those prereqs are. Our course numbers have changed yes. so much, even in the last two years. We're hoping that a lot of that will settle down. Um. Everybody's quiet today. We sent you a checklist, but also keep in mind within tools in Power Scheduler, there is a checklist. You as an LEA coordinator, if you're out there, may want to have your schools also do this checklist so that you can keep track of where they are within their power scheduler and their scheduling um, information at that point. Rooms. It is not mandatory that, that rooms have departments, but it is highly recommended that you put departments on your rooms. Because the system looks at a teacher's department, it looks at a courses department, and then it tries to find a room with the same department in order to schedule that course in that room. If you don't do that, you may end up with an English teacher in a computer science lab room. Or the band. Or the band room. Seen that. Yes. Yeah. All right, we have another question. Um, okay. When I look at the courses in red in my course catalog, these are NCVPS or OL courses offered this year that might not be offered next year. Do I just leave them? You can leave them. You just need to make sure that you do no scheduling into those courses. You have no sections of them or anything. It won't transfer over anyway, but make sure that you have not got students requesting them. You want to make sure that you uh, give those students a different course number request. But you can leave them. They just won't copy over if they're ended courses. And she, she should have. If she can, just uncheck them. Yeah. She should get rid of the red. Yeah. If you uncheck them, make them not available in that catalog, you should be fine, too. 
when you're in your course catalog, if you say active courses, it'll put all your red ones at the bottom, and you'll have them all clumped together for easy unchecking. Several things to keep in mind as you start this process is the, the um, end of the year. Again, it's going to be sometime around that last week in June. We do not have a final date yet, but you want to keep in mind and base everything on that because that's when all of this process for scheduling must be done and committed back to the live side. So base your information that you start to send out to your schools on that. The sooner you get completed with your requests and everything, the more accurate information you can have for your principals to determine if they need different teachers or, you know, information like that based on requests for students. Please keep in mind we'll be doing more of these. So as you start this process and start to get questions, make sure you write them down. If you'll go to the uh, NC SIS training calendar on the NC SIS site, you can sign up for, for the webinars there. Starting in March, they will be every Wednesday. And we have, we'll have one two-hour session at the symposium as well. It'll be on the calendar there. So this question says, the checklist that I got says creating the year long term is at the LEA level. When I gave the checklist to the schools, they thought they didn't have to do this. Um, this caused them to have all red courses in the course catalog. Yes. They should be able to go back and create their next year in years and terms, and those courses can then be set to available, and that should clear up the course catalog. We will try to do some adjusting on that checklist to make sure that schools know they also have to set up their years and terms. No, that check the checklist was ours. Our checklist. I know Wendy was working on hers last week. We she was adding things. We went along and one of it was a full stride. If you need that checklist, go ahead and send an email to Erin or Wendy and I, and we'll see about getting that for you. We've reached another point where we have no questions. Think of anything else we need to go over with them. Well, I know this is a little ahead of the game, but one of the things is, you know, when you're sending a bill and you don't want anyone to accidentally hit that bill button, several people have asked us in the past how to stop people from building. One of the ways you can do is go into your scenario and click it to be a build only. A load only. A load only. I'm sorry. Thank you, Sue Ann. <laughs> Have Sue Ann to keep me honest. We're going to click onto our scenario, and if you do load only and submit, and go and once you submit, you actually have to go back to Power School and back to Power Scheduler because we want to refresh. 
And then when we go back into Power Scheduler, no one can hit build. We're only a load. So that would be a way to stop people from building after you finish building. Something to keep in mind, too, is I suggested that my school um, make a copy of that scenario once okay. they're finished. So if something happens to the one that they, the original one that was active, they still have everything set up there. Um, you can have as many scenarios and as many catalogs as you want. The only thing to keep in mind is only one scenario and only one catalog can be active at one time. What you do in scenario A does not affect what you do in scenario B. So if you're trying to carry things through each catalog, you have to remember to make it active and update the information there. And if you keep meticulous notes in your, where you're doing your comments within your queues, it, you can always go back and import the one you like best. Now, Doris just changed that scenario to a load scenario. If I decide I want to go change something, in, I can go back into that same scenario and click build, submit, and it then becomes an active build scenario again. So we didn't take away her ability to build. We just took away the eagerness of others to hit the button. See, my build is right back. There we go. Just a little tip. You want to make sure before you start your build validation or your load validation, you create your course rank. That's once you've gotten everything done for the pre-schedule and all your requests in. Okay, any more questions, Aaron? Nothing on the board right now. Wendy, do you have anything you want to remind them of? Um, I would like to remind everyone that when you get ready to commit, that we recommend you do that about the middle of June, so that you're not waiting until the very last moment to do that commit process. That way, if you have any problems or things don't all go over and commit as you've expected, we have time to get those things fixed. So you can log a ticket with DPI, with the Home Base Support Center, and there's time then to take care of that problem. Whereas if you wait until the last week, then if you have a problem that occurs, there may not be enough time to get it fixed. So we really recommend that everyone do that commit process by about the middle of June and not wait until the end of June. <coughs> Again, this is a process that you don't want to enter into <coughs> all by yourself. You need a scheduling team at the school to be able to do that with you. I mean, the principal knows how many allotments he has for teachers and what he wants taught and how he wants it taught and when he wants it taught and who he wants to teach it. So you need to, you need to get with that scheduling team and get all of that information. Another thing to remember is we know that you're not going to know for sure all of your allotments before the end of the school year. Sometimes you do have changes in allotments that occur during the summer. And if that happens, you'll be hand tweaking your schedule and making some manual adjustments. And that's fine. We know that that happens. What you want to have done is a somewhat completed schedule with what you're happy with 
by the middle of June so that you can go ahead and commit that, um, do that commit process so that you'll have those sections with those teachers assigned and the students in classes before the EOI takes place at the end of June and then in July knowing that you may have to make some adjustments. That always happens. Nobody ever, ever is 100% finished in June and never has to make any changes over the summer. That just doesn't happen. So just know that you're never going to get to where you're 100%, or most of you are not going to get to where you're 100% happy with what you have and knowing that you're not going to have to make any changes. We all know that we usually are going to have to make some changes on the live side after EOI. Keep in mind you do want to load those students before you commit though. Unlike our legacy system, once you're on the live side, there's no load process for reloading those students again. Absolutely. And you want to remember you can only commit once. It is not like our legacy system where we could do that copy process multiple times. You can only commit once and if something changes and you need to run that commit process again, you'll have to contact the support center so that they can go into those background tables and remove the records so that you can commit again. Now the system will let you do it. But if you keep committing over and over again without contacting the support center first, you are going to be creating a big mess. So don't do it. Yes, they will. Now you were talking about a load, Wendy. Also, before they do their last load, they should remember that those dates need to be correct in Power Scheduler. Yes, thank you, Doris. Uh, because we want to be yes. sure with those. Go ahead. Your years and terms is what she's talking about. Yeah. The years and terms and power scheduler state must be correct prior to your final load and hand tweaking because those CC records will have that date of what you have in power scheduler if you haven't corrected it. And those need to be corrected before the final load? That is my understanding. Yes. Yes, before the final load. What happens when you do the load process is it creates the enrollment records into the courses for the students and it uses the dates that are in your Power Scheduler years and terms. And sometimes when we get started working in Power Scheduler, we don't have our approved calendar yet for next year, so we have to guess at the dates to use. As soon as you know the correct dates, you need to correct those in Power Scheduler in your years and terms. And if you haven't done it and you're getting ready to load or you're in the loading process, you need to fix those dates and make them correct before you load for the very last time. Otherwise, you will have some problems on the live side later after you've done your commit because you will have a mismatch between your um, enrollment records and what the years and terms dates are. We, we had some of this this year. The bill, the bill will be okay. It's the, the, it's date. the load. Yeah. The section level 10 is not on the power schedule that might be safe with the students that we found. Trying to think of some more things that you might need. Oh, periods. Mm. Periods need to be numeric. And you see the course where they're checked? That relates back to where you saw that student schedule course. 10% or 100%. They're all checked and they're all expected to be course. Homeroom name. 
cannot be HR. It needs to be a number. What I want to say here is you can. You're, if you'll notice here in periods, I have ID equals 1. In this case, I have name 1 and abbreviation 1. I can change the name to 61. Some people do this for 6th grade classes, 7th grade classes. What you need to know and to keep in mind when you do this is that a lot of reports and DDE will pull the ID, not the name or the abbreviation. So if you hand a principal a report that you've pulled and say, well, my 6th graders are section 60 or period 61, He's not going to see 61. He's going to see 1. So that's just something you need to keep in mind. Something else to keep in mind is you can move these periods, but on a student's schedule, the periods fall in order. So even though you've moved it to the top, it's going to end up in fourth place because it is number 4 ID. Sections have to be numeric and they cannot be starting with a zero. Neither can periods be starting with a zero. Alpha in section numbers. No alpha. Sections are numeric also. Something that we've talked about some is, you know, you could do your 61, 71, 81 through section numbers because you can generate section numbers yourself. You do not have to allow the system to do it. Teachers can see section numbers. They go to their preferences and click the checkbox that says show section numbers. So they will be able to see section 61 is a sixth grade class. Section 71 is a seventh grade class. Just some food for thought there. Days. Days are actually alpha. Periods, are new, periods and sections are numeric, days are alpha, and it should just say like A day, B day, C day. It shouldn't say day, it just should say A. It should say B. We do not recommend using Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Excuse me, Thursday, Friday. What if you happen to have a snow day on a Monday and you come in on a Tuesday and the principal decides he wants to do Monday's classes on Tuesday? Then you've got a mismatch within your calendar. <clears throat> SAR is looking for A, B, C, D, E. How do they generate section numbers? How do they generate? The system will automatically generate section numbers for you. You can go in and change them. Or if you create the sections by hand, you can just say section number 61. So let's say in Power Scheduler, I'm going to create a section of a course. Right here where it says section number, I can put in the section number myself. You want to always have this closed section at max checked. In the load process, you're asked if you want to close sections at max. You can leave that unchecked and it will overload the classes for you so you can see where you might have a problem. Once you've finished all of that and you definitely want to close your sections at max, if this is not checked on the course, then what happens, even if you check it in the load process, it overloads the classes anyway. So the course definitely needs to have closed sections at max checked. And if you create a section after it is built, you have to check the section that you create because it will not check it automatically if the course is checked because you're adding after the system has already added to it. Okay. Just FYI. Somebody mentioned you might have had some trailing spaces in your A's and B's. I might have had some trailing spaces in my A's and B's. That's bad. That's bad information for you. Sorry we'll, about that. We'll discipline Sue Ann after the <laughs> Oh, I'm so proud of somebody. <laughs> I had to tell a few people what trailing spaces were. What they, what they were talking about is here, it had days. If you'll notice, when I click back in the box, I have a space after my A. That needs to be taken out of there. Same thing with B. That needs to be taken out of there. You should have no leading spaces or trailing spaces in your periods 
or your day, or your years and terms. Or your course group. Or right. your course group thing. Or anywhere. Pretty much anywhere. Right. I will also tell you, course groups, when you do set up screens, be careful how you name your course group, because if you name the name too long, it doesn't show up as a group on your screen setup. So if you've got a course group that's not showing up, and you look at it and the name's 1,500 letters long, you might want to fix that and make it short. Yeah. It's either going to be too long or close spaces as well. Yeah. Now, you're talking about that. What about a upcoming eighth grader coming to a high school and they can't see their screen? Upcoming eighth grader must be transitioned to next school, to the high school, before they can see their eighth graders, and future the, ninth graders. And the middle school has to set up a simple scenario for them to be able to see the screens at the high school. Yep. So middle schools, even if you aren't going to use Power Scheduler, you have to set up just a very simple scenario in Power Scheduler so that your eighth graders who are transitioning to the high school will be able to see the high school's course request screens. So it may look something like this. I've switched over to the middle school. I'll go into Power Scheduler and I say Auto Scheduler Setup. I'm just going to say full year, period. One. I just do one period and one, one day. And one day. Full year continue. Now, do they need to go ahead and finish the process? That should be, um, they, they may need to set the schedule year. Okay. Functions. All the way to the bottom, set schedule year. Oh, I didn't change the name. Okay. So if they want it to be 15, 16, they can come here and change that name. And this will now allow them to see the course screens at that at the uh, high school level. We had a few of this last <laughs> year uh, calling just hours prior to meeting it. So be aware of that right now. Assuming the high school counselor can see eighth graders, how could historical grades be seen for those students? Oh, that's very easy. On the power scheduler side, as long as the eighth graders have been pre-transitioned, oh, wrong term, I'm sorry, have been sent to the next school of high school, uh, by going to print power scheduler, I'm going to go and select eighth grade. I'm going to go student. Then we're going to select uh, current grade of 8th grade. And that will bring on my 8th graders, and I'm going to select my first one. And now I'm going to go back to Power Schedule. And now my current selection is 283 students. And I can now select my first student, go to the student pages, and see my information. You can even print labels from this area now. There we go, historical grades. And that's how you can view that information. You kind of have to trick the system. You have to get them in Power Scheduler and pick them there, and then look at them in on the live side, outside of the bubble. That's a good student we got up here. Got all A's. Ooh, 99. <laughs> That's because the teacher's sharp. <laughs> Great thing about Power Scheduler this year that I've noticed, the 8.1. That's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have too far? 
when you click on students, you have next year grade level or current year grade level. That way you're not questioning yourself. I right. like that too. You may have at your middle school several different feeder schools that your kids go to. So make sure you check that information and set them to the next school that's correct. Also for EOI, you need to make sure you have next school and next grade set for those students, for all your students at all your schools. That next grade process and auto-fill student information Empower Scheduler can be done over and over and over again until you start to make hand changes for your retained students. You don't want to do it anymore after that. What you may want to suggest is once you've run that process once, when you start to enroll a new student, suggest that your data managers just go to that schedule setup screen and go ahead and set it up at that time. Right as they enroll a new student. Just an extra step. And to end in that same aspect, they should remember also when you're withdrawing the student to go to that same screen, remove all course requests, and uncheck next year scheduling information. Right. So clear that setup screen out. Yeah. It's just as important for leaving student as it is for entering student. This is the screen that Doris was talking about that you want to clear out. <laughs> so you select your student, and down under scheduling, you have schedule setup. As you withdraw a student, this is the screen that you want to make sure is cleared out. Also, in the process of withdrawing, you'll notice that um, transfer out of school. There's this little check box that says check here if student intend to enroll in school during the next school year. Don't check that because what happens is that automatically checks schedule this student and he will show up in your power scheduler for next year. So you want to make sure you don't do that. If he comes back next year, you can go to scheduling setup and check that box. Okay, cool. And also, if you're trying to pull a student into your school and you get the, the error that the records have not yet been released, it is most likely because the previous school has not cleared the scheduling setup screen. It's not because the transfer student records is broken. <laughs> if you get an error that actually tells you what the problem is, that means it's working and something hasn't been done. And usually it's the scheduling setup screen has not been cleared. And if they have requests in there, if you don't remove those, they have a school ID attached to them and the other school can actually end up scheduling them. Yep. Or they may come into your school and you see requests. Those requests are not yours. They actually belong to the previous school. And they will not schedule within the right. school. had a lot of really good questions this time. Going back into Power Scheduler, see if there's anything else we want to cover.
things like buildings, facilities, houses, teams, very restrictive pieces of information. So use them sparingly. If you know that you have a course that has to be taught in a kitchen, that's the only place it can be taught, that's a good use of a facility. You have a facility named kitchen and you attach that facility to that course. Using a lot of facilities and a lot of other constraints make it hard for the system to work. Now, chains do work, does work very well, particularly at the middle school level. It really works functions as you expect teams work, but there is a lot of setup to it if you're using teams. Section types. There are four places that section types have to be connected. Section types have to be connected to the course, to the student, to the teacher, and the section itself. So once it's built, you have to connect it to that section. And during all your building and loading, please remember to make use of all those reports. You don't necessarily have to print them to use them. Just look at them. They'll give you the information you need. Something may be sticking out like a sore thumb. Just enclose it and get back fix it and run it again. So this is Wendy Henson, and this ha I'm getting ready to make an announcement, and I, I don't know who on the phone might be affected. I don't know if there are any Region 8 people on the phone, on the webinar. But I just got a phone call from our PD, one of our PD leads in Region 8, and Region 8 is where one of the areas where we're having the prepare to schedule workshops this week, and they are going to be in Asheville at AB Tech. And I just got a phone call that says it's snowing in Asheville. <laughs> Actually, all over Region 8, apparently. Um, so if you are a Region 8 person on the phone, just know I am going to send out some information shortly. But if AB Tech is on a delayed schedule, we will, we will go in on the delayed schedule tomorrow. If they are canceled, we will move everyone to the Thursday, Friday session unless we can work something else out. But I think that's what we're going to have to do right now. But I just wanted to let you know that it is snowing. I just got a phone call. Um, it is snowing in Region 8, so we will likely be affected by weather this week in Region 8. Sorry. Weather happens. It does. I was hoping we would make it through one more week without any snow. <laughs> you haven't yet. No. Now, I, I had snow at the beach last week. I know. I saw where one of the fellows had turned around to go back home because it was yeah. too bad to drive. Yeah. It's pretty bad when you leave the city to go to the coast to see snow. Yeah. Yep. We just sleep. Right. You can use the visual scheduler. A couple things I want to show you about the visual scheduler, though, is once you start moving things on the visual scheduler, you need to look at it very carefully, open it up, because a lot of times the information doesn't move with the course. I don't have any courses in here, but also down here in the left-hand corner is a little grid-like thing that you can open up that shows you what other courses are in conflict with that particular course and how many requests there are for that. Okay. Also over here on the left-hand side, if you open it up, you can see how many students you have in that grade level and how many seats you have available for that grade level during that period. Just some little bits of information with the Power Visual Scheduler. Make sure if you move a course from one to another, you open it up and make sure everything transferred with it. And if you add a section, ensure that you open it up and that all the 
information is there because it typically is not all there, particularly flows at max. So using the visual scheduler, you need to take a lot of precautions with that. We've got about 15 minutes, so make sure you get your questions in. This is the last week of those prepare to schedule workshops. So if you didn't get to attend one, make sure you request the information or speak to someone in your LEA who has been. Your, your LEA people are going to be your best people to speak to. Um, they'll be able to help you out a lot, a lot. questions have kind of slowed down a little bit. Yeah. Like Doris Elliott, do you have a question? Looks like you have a question mark beside your name. I was wondering if you have a question. Um, if you do, go ahead and type it in and we'll see if we can get it answered for you. We still have 19 people left on, so come on. You got you got a few more minutes to ask your questions. This is one of those times you can actually say, well, how do I or my school want to? Got a question on how to do it? And power scheduler, let us know. And remember, we're going to have these um, question and answer webinars again next week. We will actually have five of them, so you'll have. We, we anticipate that since we will be finished with the three weeks of the prepare to schedule workshops, that people will actually be getting into the meat of it and scheduling and starting to have more questions. So we will have Monday next Monday, a week from today, nine o'clock and one o'clock. Wednesday, one o'clock, and then Friday, nine o'clock and one o'clock. Now. On those sessions, if it looks like we're not getting a lot of participation or a lot of questions coming in, we may end those early since we have more coming up. So just wanted to let you know that. But right now we do have five of those scheduled for next week, five of these same sessions. Okay, do we have any more questions, Aaron? Negative. Remember that the service desk is available. You'll log a ticket to them. Um, we have some people that are certified on the service desk, so they should be able to answer most of your questions for you. If not, they will probably get in touch with one of us. But remember, we do have these sessions, as Wendy said. So write your questions down. and. Log in and join the session. We'll have a good time. As we said earlier, we'll provide I snacks in this room. Snacks <laughs> 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 oh, provided in the DPI room. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to say a thank you to everybody who's hosted for us so far this this last couple weeks. And for those coming up, we appreciate you being able to have a place for us to, to hold these sessions. Like what? Absolutely. Yeah. They've all been very good to us. I think the, the largest number we've had was 39 in one class. Should 
reduce the schedule a little bit of balance in those gauge yeah, You should have closed section at max. You know? I should have closed section at max, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, I have, I have missed one to have my max, so. <laughs> did you have your brain set right? I did. Okay. As long as your rooms were equal to or larger than those fours. <laughs> oh, that's something else. Oh, Keep that my, <laughs> As Doris just mentioned, your room max, make sure your room max is equal to or at least one more than your course max. If it is not, the courses will not schedule in there. Also mm -hmm. keep in well, mind if you're doing destination classes, both sections have to fit in the room. Yes. So even though you know you're only going to have 20 students max between three courses, if your course is max is set at 20 for each one of the three, you are talking 60 children that it's viewing going into a classroom that may only be set at 20. So that room max needs to be set at least 60 for those to, to all fit in there. Or your section max. Or your section max, yes. Come down. Okay. That's pretty good. I, I think since we don't have any more questions and it's just five minutes early that we're okay to go ahead and end the webinar. Um, All right. Is there anything that anybody else would like to, to mention before we do end? I don't think so. I think we're good on this end. Okay. Um, well, we have recorded the webinar and I will send the recording over to be posted. So maybe it'll be posted later today. Um, and if not, then tomorrow. But it should be out there. Just know, you know, that if you have to go back and watch it again, you just have to watch and listen to the whole thing because there's not any type of agenda or presentation that goes with it. But thank you for calling in. Um, again, we will have these sessions again next week so that you can call in. Also in March, every week in March, we will have these sessions on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. So as people are working through the, the power scheduler process and they have scheduling questions, then they know they can call in once a week in addition to logging tickets with the service desk. But thank you. Thank you, Sue Ann, Erin, um, Doris, and Tessa for all being in the room. And we will look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.